good. I only got about 30 minutes. So I'm going to hit the ground running this morning. Thank you all for coming. Welcome, welcome to week four. So this week we are going to be doing a brief overview of the postpartum period. So let's get going. Okay. So postpartum begins immediately following the birth of the infant. The focus is on providing education to the new family, care of the mother and care of the newborn. That is pretty much postpartum in a nutshell. Uh, we need to make sure that the family feels comfortable with taking care of their new baby so that when they go home, they have uh, a good idea of what they're going to need to be doing for this new baby, most especially for brand new families. Uh, maybe the families that have a couple of kids already may not need as much education, but we still want to make sure that they feel comfortable with what needs to be done for baby and for mom, because we can't forget mom, right? So we want to make sure that they have a good understanding of the care for mom, what complications to look for, uh, what to keep an eye out for, especially when we're talking about bleeding and uh, potential infections and things like that. And we can't leave out the psychosocial uh, complications that could potentially occur. So we want to make sure she has plenty or the family has plenty of education about that. We also have to make sure that they have as much education as we possibly can give them for the newborn, right, to make sure that they're comfortable with feedings and looking at feeding cues and potential complications that could occur with baby and making sure that they understand what to look for there. So basically, postpartum is all about education, really and truly. It's all about education and assessment. All right, so postpartum care begins with chapter 15 in your textbook. You're also, uh, some of your readings are also in your maternal, maternal newborn, seven, chapter 17 through 22. So basic education. When we provide basic education, we are looking at uh, the peri care, right? Let's say she had, even if she had a, a cesarean section where she didn't deliver vaginally, we still need to provide her education about peri care because she's still going to have the lochia coming out. That is what we call the bloody discharge after delivery. We call that lochia. So that's one of those terms that you may or may not be familiar with. Make sure that you get familiar with it if you aren't. Uh, so what the lochia is, it's not menstrual blood. It is a mixture of tissue and mucus, basically the shedding of the lining of the uterus, the decidua. That's uh, part of the tissue that's coming out. So initially, that blood is bright red. We call that lochia rubra. And it's that reddish color for the first few days, about three days or so, three, four days. Then it becomes more of a serosanguinous color, and we call that uh, lochia sanguinosa. And then uh, it kind of becomes more of a tannish white, and we call that uh, lochia alba. Oh, serosa, I'm sorry, sanguinosa. I was thinking serosanguinous, sorry. Serosa, Ugh. it's Monday. <laughs> I need to have more coffee, maybe. Okay, uh, some other basic education that we provide. Uh, what for mom to look for, and hopefully her partner will be able to be staying with her for at least that first 24 hours. So mom is not gonna be in the hospital for very long. So we have to try to cram in as much education as we can over the time that she's going to be there. So for a Vaginal delivery, no complications, everything went great, about 48 hours. For a cesarean section delivery, again, no complications, everything was fine, maybe about 96 hours. So when you think about how much education is needed, that's not really very much time. So when you're dealing with a prima paris family, someone that has no other children, this is their first, uh, that kind of gets complicated because there's an awful lot of education that needs to be provided. And remember, 
We also have to think about the information that they're getting from their family because, you know, grandparents, grandmothers, aunts, uh, they provide education to our families as well. So we want to make sure that we establish first where are they at as far as their knowledge, what do they know, what do they not know, and then we want to build from there. You always want to start off when you provide any education with what they already know and build. You don't need to cover ground that they already are comfortable with and have a good understanding of. You want to add to it. Okay, so activity. There's going to be some limitations. I mean, we want her to get up. We want her to move around. But there will be some limitations. So especially if she's had a cesarean section. We have to be, you know, she's not going to be able to drive initially. Uh, she should not be lifting anything heavier than baby initially. Right. So there are some limitations. We want to encourage her to rest when baby rests. Babies, newborn babies can sleep for up to 18 hours out of 24, but they don't sleep all at one time. So they sleep in spurts. So mom should really sleep when baby sleeps. When baby takes a nap, that's not the time for mom to try to clean the house and do all you know the cooking and the laundry and all of those things. And a lot of times, that's what they think they have to do, you know, because they're the mom, right? And the mom uh, is in charge of the house and takes care of the house and all of these things. There's a lot of women out there who really, you know, they take on that role and they think that's a very integral part of who they are. And it's very important to them that they're maintaining their home. They, they, that is their way of taking care of their family. So we just want to educate them that, you know, they need to take it a little bit easy, right? Rest when baby rests because baby's not going to be sleeping through the night, right? So uh, they're not going to get a full night's sleep. That doesn't exist anymore for the time being. And, you know, get the partner involved, okay? So uh, get dad involved. Get the significant other involved, the partner, whoever they may be, whoever the mom is has as her partner. Make sure that they're involved as well. You don't ever want to leave them out. So include them in all of the teaching sessions. Include them in all of the information that you are providing because they're going to be a very important support system for the mom. And they should be encouraged to do what they can do to help mom because a lot of times that partner may feel left out. Okay, so making sure that mom is getting as much rest as possible. Okay, that's going to be very important because there's a lot of healing that's going to be happening. There's a lot of adjustment in the body to try to get it back to that pre-pregnant state. So she's going to be expending a lot of energy just for virtue of that. That doesn't include taking care of baby. Just for herself, for that healing process for her, there's a lot of energy that's expended. Nutrition. Very, very important. Just as it was important during the pregnancy, it is also important during the postpartal period. So we want to make sure that we are, you know, reinforcing a varied diet. You know, don't just eat a lot of uh, junk food. Uh, make sure that you cut down on the preservatives, eat more healthy, clean foods. You know, make sure that they you know, clean their, if they're doing the fresh vegetables, that they clean them really well, especially if they're planning on breastfeeding. We want to make sure that they're getting enough calories and enough fluids. We want to make sure that they're getting plenty of fluids, mostly water. Water would be best. Uh, if they are uh, going to take caffeine, make sure that they limit that caffeine, uh, carbonated beverages, things like that. You want to make sure that they limit those. But nutrition is going to be key if they plan on breastfeeding, mostly if they plan on breastfeeding, okay? Because, you know, what, what mom gets, baby gets. So we want to make sure that she's getting a really good rounded diet with lots of vitamins and minerals and nutrients and protein and dairy and fruits, vegetables, and all that. Okay, peri care, as I kind of alluded to when I was kind of touching on the overview. Very important because infection is the enemy during the postpartal period. So every mom is going to get a peri bottle in a with you know when, when they come to the postpartum uh, unit, they're going to get a peri bottle and then we instruct them, make sure that they clean their peri area very well with the peri bottle every time they use the washroom. 
if they have an episiotomy or you know they were a vaginal delivery we want to make sure that they pat the perineum dry rather than rubbing always want to pat because that tissue is already abraded it's already you know if she has an episiotomy she already has an incision down there so we don't want her to be rubbing it and risk uh loosening any of those sutures or causing any more damage to the tissues down there making sure if she's going to use a sitz bath that she cleans that sitz bath between use now they don't give that out as a standard anymore for your postpartum clients used to be that that was a standard uh, thing that we would give all the moms now it's more if they want it then you know we educate them about it and if they want it they want to try it you know then we would give that to them but basically it's like a jacuzzi for the peri area so we want to make sure that they're cleaning it very well in between uses making sure that they are uh, using uh, antibacterial wipes or antibacterial spray because again they don't want to be sitting in any of that because infection there's going to be an increased risk of infection they should be showering and not bathing okay that's another thing showering not bathing incision care so they could have a couple of different incisions they could have the incision if they had a cesarean section they're going to have a lower abdominal incision if they had an episiotomy they're going to have the uh, vaginal incision right because the episiotomy is an actual incision that is in you know between the vag vagina and the rectum to make the opening wider to avoid any uh, tears of the vaginal when they're delivering vaginally so uh, those are the two incisions that they may have so they have to make sure they keep those nice and clean sometimes uh, what has come in favor recently in the last I want to say 10 years if they have a very large woman or an obese woman some providers like to use wound vax on the incisions to prevent infection uh, they will use a disposable wound vac it stays on for about seven days and then it just comes off on its own if it falls off before the seven days they don't have to contact their provider they don't have to worry about it it's disposable anyway but there's a lot of evidence out there that that does help to prevent incisional infections for women that have a very large panis that hangs over because of the increased moisture that happens with that skin fold so that's why they do that not all providers do it but a lot of them do a lot of them do safety safety of the mother and of the infant so when we're talking safety uh, in the postpartum units they have a surveillance system some some facilities uh, use the hugs tags other facilities uh, use I'm trying to remember the name of it it'll come to me uh, but the hugs tags are very common that, that a lot of uh, postpartum units use those it's just the manufacturer that's what changes the name so uh, there are some that actually they attach when they clamp the cord that are actually attached to the clamp for the cord that's very interesting I've never used those no facility that I ever did postpartum and ever use those but I know that they exist otherwise they would be attached uh, down by the baby's ankle so you would put that on um, after baby comes to uh, actually after the baby is born so you put the ID bands on ID bands to mom ID bands to baby ID bands to the significant other whoever that third person that mother dictates is going to have that third band it has a specific number on it and when you have to take the baby for any reason out of mom's vision where it's, the baby is not with mom you need to do your ID verification with the band that's on the baby and you and you verify it between the mom and the baby and only somebody with that band gets the baby nobody that doesn't have that band gets the baby okay so they have to have that band on and it has to uh, exactly match the one that's on the baby don't try to go by what the baby looks like because a lot of babies look alike they look very similar and sometimes they have similar clothing so you can't go by that either so if anytime you're taking the baby away from mom at any point then 
you have to make sure that you're doing those identifiers for for baby. It's for their safety. It's for mom's safety. It's for baby's safety, right? Uh, another thing that we do for safety, we educate the parents about not carrying baby around, making sure that um, if they're up out of bed, that they have the baby in the bassinet and they're wheeling the baby around with the bassinet because sometimes mom might be a little dizzy. She might lose her footing in that postpartum period, uh, especially initially right after delivery. So we don't want her to fall. Right. So we, di we definitely educate them about keeping baby in the bassinet. Rooming in, that's another safety uh, feature in the postpartum period. Uh, basically, what rooming in does is baby never leaves mom's side for any reason other than medical necessity. Otherwise, baby is with mom. Now, there's a lot of some controversy. I wouldn't say a lot because I think people are pretty used to this. This is standard now. This is considered evidence-based practice. It is considered best practice. So, the, so pretty much all postpartum units do this, where they have the baby rooming in with the parents. But, you know, there are still those uh, that, well, mom's not going to get any rest. Well, they don't have nurseries anymore, per se, not like they used to. But there are times where, depending on staffing and, and how many uh, employees we have, uh, that mom could potentially, the nurse could bring the baby into the nursing unit into the uh, nurse's station, I should say, and uh, baby can sit there for a couple of hours as long as there is somebody available to monitor baby. Baby cannot be just put into the nurse's station and left alone. There has to be somebody in the nurse's station at all times while the baby is in there. But there isn't nurseries anymore, per se, so you know there's not that to put them in. There used to be, but those don't exist anymore. And that's really for safety because that, that really cuts down the risk of infant abduction, right? Because baby is always with mom. The other thing that we do for safety is we do educate the family about not letting anybody take baby unless they have the proper identification and unless parents have been notified that somebody is going to come and take baby for whatever reason. So baby should never be taken out of uh, mom's room unless mom is aware of what's happening, dad is aware of what's happening, and, and the person that's taking the baby has the proper identification. Because anybody can get scrubs. You can buy scrubs that are very similar to whatever the scrubs the employees are wearing. These uh, people that steal babies are pretty savvy. And they do come on the units because not everybody gets checked that comes on the unit. They basically say, yeah, I'm here to visit, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times people just open the door for them. So, you know, that's not going to ensure security at all. So we always want to make sure that we're educating, you know, my, the badge should look exactly like what mine looks like. And most units have those little plastic placards underneath that, that tell them what role they're on. So that it says RN or it says CNA or it says HUC for HUC or it might say PCT. So all employees should have those types of badges that work in this area. If um, mom and dad have not been educated that you know we have to take the baby for whatever reason, they are not to let the baby go. Just because somebody comes in the room and says, yeah, I've got to take your baby. I, um, I got this, that, and the other that has to get done. Nothing really, they, the baby shouldn't have to leave for any reason other than something like a circumcision. They can't do a circumcision in the room. But anything else, lab draws, hearing screens, that can all be done in the baby's room. The baby does not have to leave the room for any of that. Babs, nothing. They don't have to leave the room for those things. The only thing really that they would absolutely have to leave the room for would be like a circumcision or if baby is having distress in some way and they need to examine baby or if there's some sort of a situation happening with baby that they are going to need to have all hands on deck for baby, they would have to take baby out of the room for something like that. But but not just for general care. They don't have to take baby out for that. And then lastly, newborn feeding. This is up to the family, what kind of feeding they want to do. We try to promote breastfeeding because, you know, it has a lot of benefits. There's a lot of benefits to breastfeeding. But 
it's not right to push the breastfeeding. And I think sometimes the staff might get a little overzealous with trying to promote breastfeeding. I, I do, I have seen that myself. It's best to support whatever decision the family makes because it's really up to them. And if you're pushing them and you're putting a lot of pressure on them to breastfeed, the breastfeeding is not going to be successful because if mom is stressed out, she's anxious, she's uh, not really happy or comfortable with breastfeeding, then that's going to affect her milk supply and that's not gonna make for successful breastfeeding. The other type of feeding obviously is bottle feeding. They've come a long way with, with formula. There's a lot, uh, I mean, it's very, very, very close to breast milk. It's never ever gonna be exactly like breast milk, but it's close. And it has, you know, I mean, there's, there's really nothing wrong with bottle feeding. There really isn't anything wrong with bottle feeding. So a lot of the benefits to breastfeeding, there's benefits to mom. It stimulates that endogenous release of oxytocin. It helps to, uh, her uterus to contract, to prevent bleeding. Um, it has a lot of benefits for baby because of the uh, passive immunity that is uh, between mom and baby through the milk. And that helps baby for about three months. So there, there are a lot of benefits. There are a lot of benefits. But I don't think that we need to be overzealous in promoting breastfeeding because that doesn't help. Any questions on what I just covered? because I actually have a few other things I wanted to go over. Nobody has asked, I haven't seen anything in the chat either. Okay, all right. If you have a question, feel free to shout it out because I don't always catch the chat. Is that the reason why they canceled the baby units, like the nurseries because of baby theft or children being stolen? Or that is one of the reasons, yes. And also for bonding, it, it helps to promote bonding um, and, for safety, I mean, it really, really, really is for safety because again, mix-ups happen. And when you take the baby away from the parents, let's say you walk the baby into, I mean, the nurseries, they used to house, you know, 20 or so babies, however many babies were there, they sh they were, you know, they, ha they had to be able to accommodate whatever their census would be. So, you know, they could, they could have a lot of babies in there. I mean, I used to work in the nursery a lot and it wasn't unusual to have 15 or 20 babies in the nursery at any given time. It'd be very easy to, to confuse them and mix them up, even though, I mean, you, you're doing those IDs and you have the ID and you're checking the numbers and all that, but still human error exists. So to me, I thought it made perfect sense to have them rooming in. I thought that was a great idea. And I think the majority of the parents really like it. I really do. I, I think that they like it a lot because then they just feel safe. Baby's always there and they feel safe. And if they can have their significant other, their partner, their husband, whomever they may be, staying with them, they should still be able to get a little bit of sleep, you know, just have the partner help out. You gotta, you, you know, they gotta do their part too. So you just have to encourage that. Did that answer your question, Belinda? I did, I agree. I just wanted to know your thought on that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea, I do. I mean, I understand that they they don't get a lot of sleep once they go home, I get that. Um, but I think for, for safety, it's a good idea. It's a really good idea. So since we're talking about bonding, we kind of alluded to it. So part of our role in postpartum is to try to promote bonding, right? To help with the bonding process the transition to parenthood. It can be challenging for our new families with limited experience with babies. They might feel a lot of stress and anxiety and inadequacy with their parent role. I don't know what I'm doing. What do I do when the baby does this? What do I do when the baby does that? So part of our role is to try to provide that supportive, uh, environment for teaching, just really being supportive of that new family and encouraging and uh, just letting them know, you know, you're going to, it's going to be fine. You know, it's going to be fine. You don't have to know everything today. You're going to learn as you go, but we're going to give you the building blocks, right? We're going to give you the building blocks and making sure to let them know if they run into any trouble, they can always call. They can call the units. They can call their provider's office, you know, but there's always a way to get the answers if they need them. 
And they may also feel some social isolation because we do educate them to try to limit visitors. You know, they don't need to show the baby off to the entire community. You know, keep the visitors down to a minimum, especially in our environment today, right? With everything happening, we don't want newborn babies out in the community a lot. We want them to be home more because babies don't have an established immune system and they aren't going to have one, especially newborns. All they have is what they get from mom if mom is breastfeeding. If mom is not breastfeeding, they're not even getting that. So we definitely educate them to limit the visitors, make sure that the visitors are not sick, and also making sure about good hand washing uh, and all of those types of things. Not to have anybody coming around baby that feels like they're coming down with something because there's just too much risk. Everybody wants to see baby, but we need to limit that. You know, there's uh, social platforms now. You can FaceTime, you can do like we're doing right now, WebEx or whatever the case may be, Google Chats. You know, you can videotape baby and they can see baby without having actually having to be in the same room with them. So they do, we do educate them about that and sometimes they might feel some isolation because of that. Uh, the assessments focus on the interaction that we're seeing between the family and the new baby and how the family is adjusting to parenthood. And I always say family, I don't just focus on mom. I'm saying family because the dad or the significant other, the partner, they're included, right? I'm, when you're taking care of a postpartum family, remember the family is your patient, not just the mom, not just the baby, but everybody who's involved with them is also part of your patient. And so you are observing all of that. Does that make sense for everybody? Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. All right. So just quickly, I'm not going to go through any specific complications because uh, you're going to get a lot of that information in the lecture recording that I've posted. So what I'm just going to cover is basically what is our role with complications? What is the nursing care? So most women recover very quickly. Um, most women are fairly young when they have babies, and so they recover very quickly. But complications can happen. Uh, we can get incisional infections. There can be, if they're breastfeeding, they can have uh, mastitis that might develop in one of the breasts or both of the breasts, right? If the if baby is not latching appropriately and the the breast tissue ends up getting abraded. It's an open area for bacteria. You know, babies' mouths have bacteria, so mastitis can develop. Uh, if they uh, have a plugged milk duct, again, mastitis could develop. They could get engorgement. Uh, they can end up with bleeding, right? Bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. So we are the liaisons between the family and the care provider. So our assessments are key to the best outcomes. We need to be very good with our assessments. So we have a systematic approach to postpartum assessments called Bubble Heat. And you're, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail with that, but that is the acronym that we use. So breasts, uterus, bladder, bowel, lochia, and then um, the, um, excuse me, hemorrhoids. <laughs> but in the textbook, it talks about the home sign. That, so we're going to be following the textbooks, but technically, best evidence now is the uh, the hemorrhoids. It's uh, it's no longer the home sign because the home sign is not very accurate in some cases. They may have a positive home sign but not have a DVT because a DVT can be a common side effect or a common complication in postpartum. But current evidence. And current best practice is no longer to rely on the home sign. But for the purposes of things like exams, uh, the textbook covers home and sign. So that's what we're going with. And then emotions is the last one. So we are monitoring their emotions because there's a lot of hormonal influx happening during postpartum. So postpartum depression, baby blues, uh, baby blues are very common. The baby blues are very, very common. Most women or a large percentage of women have 
some form of baby blues. It could be like being on a roller coaster, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, postpartum depression is a little more rare, but it can occur. So definitely we have our uh, assessments geared toward that. We are monitoring that all the time. We're always asking them how they're doing, how they're feeling. We do a screening before we let them be discharged and go home. They also do a screening at, in the pediatrician's office at their two week visit. And then they do a screening uh, in the OB's office when they come for their six week appointment. So postpartum depression is something that we check very frequently. We want to make sure that we know if this is occurring because it can cause a lot of problems with bonding. It can cause, I mean, it can, if it's left untreated or unidentified, it could lead to in very, very, very severe, very rare cases a postpartum psychosis. If they're going through a postpartum psychosis episode, those are the moms that we would be most concerned about to harm the infant or harm themselves. Okay, but again, that is extremely rare, but it is something to be aware of. But nurses are integral to preventing these types of complications from occurring because the complications could be either physiological when you're talking about postpartum hemorrhage or psychosocial when you're talking about either a, a, a baby blue or a postpartum depression. Baby blues are very common. That's not, so, I mean, it's something that we're aware of and it's something that we educate about. But postpartum depression is a much more significant problem that would need to be dealt with. If they have a history of depression in their past, if they have a medical history of that or an underlying diagnosis of depression, obviously those women are going to be at increased risk for postpartum depression. If they've had a history of postpartum depression in a previous pregnancy, those women would also be at an increased risk for postpartum depression. Okay. So any questions over anything I covered today, guys? All right, well, that's all I got for you today. Um, I know that uh, I've had some inquiries about when exam results are gonna be available. I can tell you right now, it may not be until tomorrow. It really depends because there's a lot of respondents use happening right now. And I have to wait until the exam videos have been processed because I have to view those. So it could take time. It could take up to 24 hours, I'm just telling you. I will have them up as soon as I can get them up. Okay, I just wanted to let everybody know that. Okay, well that's all I got. I had a question. Okay. About the ATIs, mm -hmm. the um, quizzes, is it 3.0 or 2.0? They updated the system this uh, weekend. 2.0. 2.0 quizzes? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks for asking that, Ron. Thanks. I forgot about that. I appreciate you bringing that up. Sure. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome, guys. Thank you so much for coming.